Hello and welcome once again. We have reached a halfway point now in the series that aims to look at whether the Islamic State terrorist group, more commonly known as ISIS, can use traditional Islamic sources to justify their atrocious actions. We are now at episode 8 and you can see the titles of the remaining 7 episodes on screen. So let's begin with part 8, Brutality. Obviously, many of the things we've mentioned so far that ISIS have done, like beheading prisoners of war, is brutal in and of itself. But when I'm speaking about brutality here, it's about the odd execution or two which are creative in some twisted way, with the aim of terrorizing the group's enemies into the fear that they may too be captured and end up having a similar fate. There are far too many brutal executions that we've seen committed so far by Islamic State, so documenting all of them would mean this video would run for too long. So I'll just provide a few examples here of the types of executions I'm referring to. I won't be showing you the moments people die, but you'll see enough to get an idea of the horror these people went through. If you would rather not see any of this and wish to skip this part entirely, click on the time code shown on screen where I move on to the next point. Here we have four people who are allegedly spies working for the Iraqi government in Mosul by pointing out Islamic State targets to the Air Force. We obviously have no idea whether they are in fact spies or not, but to be honest, if they were, then we all owe them, and others like them, a lot of gratitude for working against ISIS covertly in cities which are controlled by ISIS, knowing fully well what the ramifications would be if they were caught. They are placed in a vehicle, and the executioner fires off two rocket-propelled grenades, otherwise known as RPGs, at the vehicle. The rockets didn't do a great amount of damage in their hits, but they do set the car on fire, so the occupants were just burnt to death. This man in Libya, another alleged spy, is tied to the back of a car by rope by Islamic State fighters in the city of Derna, and dragged through the streets, screaming in agony until he eventually dies. Here we have more alleged spies who are placed in a cage and lowered into a pool to forcibly drown. ISIS even had waterproof cameras mounted to the side of the cage that filmed these five men as they drown and scream desperately under the surface of the water. Once they emerge, you can see bubbles and foaming at the mouth with some struggling to get their breath. It's a horrendous sight to witness, but it begs the question. Here we only have five people who were drowned alive and it was ruthless and barbaric in every way. So how can believers of the Abrahamic faith tell us that the people who did this are brutal and evil, but their god, who they call great and the most merciful, drowned the entire world according to their beliefs, including what must have been millions of innocent animals as well as the so-called sinful humans in the Noah's Ark story? Aren't believers in fact disrespecting a god if he actually did exist? by making him out to be nothing short of a psychopathic mass murderer? That note leads us on to the most notorious example of ISIS brutality, the burning alive of the Jordanian pilot. The world was outraged that a man was subjected to immense torture for just over a minute as he was burnt alive. But not many believers will stop and think that the god they idolize will not only do this to one person for one minute, but has promised to do this to billions of people, many of whom will have this done to them eternally, with their burnt skin being constantly replaced with new skin so the torture can continue. Can Muslims and other religions who believe in this hell really call this god all-merciful? Or does that obviously require a lot of mental gymnastics and cognitive dissonance? When it came to the killing of the Jordanian pilot, many Muslims thought they had finally found a good reason to call ISIS un-Islamic. Out of all the horrors they had done up until that point, this was the first time many had felt the group had clearly done something that goes directly against the teachings of Islam, and they pointed to this authentic hadith, authentic at least to Sunni Islam, which said Muslims should not burn people, because this was a punishment reserved for God alone. Some Zanadiqah, atheists, were brought to Ali and he burnt them. The news of this event reached Ibn Abbas who said, If I had been in his place, I would not have burnt them, as Allah's messenger forbade it, saying, Do not punish anybody with Allah's punishment. I would have killed them according to the statement of Allah's messenger. Whoever changed his religion, then kill him. So basically what he's saying is, killing these people was totally fine, just as long as you don't burn them. So if this is the case, then why did ISIS burn this Jordanian pilot? Well, because once again with Islamic teachings, you'll see them contradicting each other. The main justification ISIS used in this instance was by going to the Quran, which is more authoritative than the hadith we just read. They cite this verse in chapter 16 verse 126. If you were to retaliate, retaliate to the same degree as the injury done to you. But if you resort to patience, it is better for the patient. 
In the video, they show us the pilot touring places which have been hit by airstrikes. ISIS claimed that the bombs he dropped had incinerated some of the people targeted by them. And according to the verse we just mentioned, they felt justified burning him alive in response. You may ask, but what about the other killings? Surely these people accused of being spies didn't drown other people or drag people through the streets. That's correct, they didn't. So how was this justified? This is where it gets into jurisprudence and what classical scholars had said on the issue of providing a form of shock and awe that would terrorize Islam's enemies. In this video ISIS released burning the Jordanian pilot Mu'ad al-Kisazba, they were careful to provide their reference from Ibn Taymiyyah, a classical scholar that Salafist Muslims like ISIS revere. They quote him in the video as saying the following, If the use of brutal methods has the effect of either bringing others towards the faith or terrifying them from committing aggressions against the Muslims, then it is considered to be a lawful punishment within the bounds of legitimate jihad. So ISIS justifies the use of any brutal method because they consider it as a form of discouraging what they regard as further aggression from those who are fighting them. It's not as clear-cut as taking this direct from a Quranic verse or an authentic hadith, so their interpretation of Islamic laws in these regards can be considered slightly controversial. I mean, you may even be able to argue that verses like this one we mentioned in the first episode which encourages extremism can be interpreted to justify what they do when meeting out horrendous punishments. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and those with him are hard against the disbelievers and merciful among themselves. But ISIS in their video were citing the scholar's opinion and not this Quranic verse. So, even if we disregard this opinion from this scholar, we unfortunately find many examples of brutality riddled throughout Islamic history. In regard to burning people alive, we know that senior companions and followers of Muhammad burnt people alive too. We already saw earlier in the hadith that Ali had burnt people alive. But we also hear about Abu Bakr, the first caliph after Muhammad's death, burned someone as well. On pages 80 and 81 of the 10th volume of the history of Tabari, we read about Abu Bakr fighting apostates. Muslims basically apostatized in large numbers and left Islam directly after the death of Muhammad. And the first caliph had a huge challenge ahead of him to keep the religion intact. So he went on major offensives across the Arabian Peninsula to force people back to Islam. We are told the story of a man called Al-Fuja'a who promises to fight alongside Abu Bakr against the apostates. He receives weapons from Abu Bakr but then goes to use those weapons to fight Muslims instead. Abu Bakr has his fighters track him down and bring him back. Then Abu Bakr does the following. When he was brought to Abu Bakr, he ordered a fire to be kindled with much firewood in the prayer yard of Medina and threw him, with arms and legs bound, into it. Muslims can dispute the authenticity of these stories all they want. But authenticity and who is deemed trustworthy in a particular chain of narrators for any given story is always going to be a subjective opinion. When a Muslim reads through Islamic history, he isn't expected to then go and spend an entire lifetime looking through other books to see what scholar X or scholar Y had to say about this narration or that one. When it's in your history books, you can't then go around saying these things have absolutely nothing to do with Islam. So Ali burnt people, Abu Bakr burnt people, what about Muhammad? Well, he certainly threatened to burn people. In a narration classified by mainstream Muslims as authentic, Muhammad says he planned to punish those who did not pray by burning their houses on top of them. The Prophet said, No doubt I intended to order somebody to pronounce the iqamah of the compulsory congregational prayer and then I would go to the houses of those who do not attend the prayer and burn their houses over them. So Muhammad contemplated punishing some people who didn't go and pray by burning their houses on top of them. What if ISIS were to do that today and filmed it happening while we see those inside the house along with their families screaming in agony simply because they didn't turn up to prayers at the mosque? Muslims might argue here that it appears he didn't follow through on the threat. So let's look at an example of brutality that would put ISIS to shame that Muhammad had in fact carried out according to the most trusted source following the Quran for mainstream Muslims, Sahih Bukhari. We read, Some people from the tribe of Ukl came to the Prophet and embraced Islam. The climate of Medina did not suit them, so the Prophet ordered them to go to the camels of charity and to drink their milk and urine. They did so, and after they had recovered from their ailment, they turned renegades and killed the shepherd of the camels and took the camels away. The Prophet sent in their pursuit, and so they were brought. Then the Prophet ordered that their hands and legs should be cut off, and that their eyes should be branded with heated pieces of iron, and that their cut hands and legs should not be cauterized till they die. 
Now, what these people did was obviously wrong, and you can even argue that the person who killed the herder deserved to be executed. But what Muhammad did here was inexcusable. This story was one of the stories that led me to really question the nature and character of Muhammad. I couldn't imagine how the founder of this so-called religion of peace would be so barbaric in his actions. Let's recap. He decides to chop off hands and feet, then sticks large nails into their eyes and leaves them to bleed to death. Just imagine ISIS doing this to anybody today, regardless of what alleged crime they committed, and releasing a video showing all of this occurring in HD in front of our eyes. Wouldn't we be hearing the apologists say that their actions had nothing to do with Islam? Luckily, ISIS haven't actually done this yet. We all know where they would have got this horrific brutality from. I'll cite a few more quick examples of brutality we find in Islamic sources. Another authentic hadith gives us the following story. A Jew crushed the head of a woman between two rocks and killed her. So the Messenger of Allah crushed his head between two rocks. Next we have the story of an old woman called Umm Qirfa. Muhammad ordered a group of Muslim fighters, led by his former adopted son Zayd ibn Haritha, to attack the Bani Fuzara tribe. In volume 8 of Tabari's history, page 96, we read, The Messenger of God sent him with an army against the Bani Fuzara. He met them in Wadi al-Qura and inflicted casualties on them. Qais ibn al-Musahhir al-Ya'muri killed Mas'ada ibn Hakama bin Malik bin Badr and took Umm Qirfa prisoner. Her name was Fatima bin Rabi'ah bin Badr. She was married to Malik ibn Hudayfa bin Badr. She was a very old woman. He also took one of Umm Qirfa's daughters and Abdullah ibn Mas'ada prisoner. Zayd ibn Haritha ordered Qais to kill Umm Qirfa and he killed her cruelly. He tied each of her legs with a rope and tied the ropes to two camels and they split her in two. Seriously. A very old woman has her legs tied to ropes and camels split her in two. What a way to go. It sounds like something you'd see in a violent video game like Mortal Kombat. Hang on. Maybe that's where they got the inspiration for this fatality. (laughs) New Cyborg wins. Flawless victory. Another strange and brutal story that we have is a story involving Moses in the Quran. Moses meets a wise man who was given great knowledge from God. Moses accompanies this man who then does a number of things which Moses doesn't initially approve of, including murdering a child. We read chapter 18 verse 74 of the Quran. So they went on until when they met a boy, he slew him. Musa said, have you slain an innocent person otherwise than for manslaughter? Certainly you have done an evil thing. After Moses complained, this supposedly wise man responded as follows in verses 80 and 81. And as for the boy, his parents were believers, and we feared lest he should make disobedience and ingratitude to come upon them. So we desired that their Lord might give them in his place one better than him in purity and nearer to having compassion. What a poor excuse. This is just simply an honor killing. A reminder here is that the person who is supposed to be good is the one who just murdered a child. Why did God create this child in the first place if he felt he needed to be killed because his parents deserved better? So the Quran doesn't give us the details on how this boy was murdered, but the authentic hadiths of Sahih Bukhari gives us conflicting accounts. The first variation tells us that this great knowledgeable man slaughtered the child with a knife, much like how ISIS behead people today. They found boys playing and Al-Khadr got hold of a handsome infidel boy, laid him down and then slew him with the knife. A second variation from Sahih Bukhari as well tells us he grabbed his head and separated it with brute force. Then he proceeded further and found a boy playing with other boys. Al-Khadr took hold of the boy's head from the top and plucked it out with his hands, i.e. killed him. A third variation found elsewhere was that he smashed his head against the wall or with a rock. Tafsir Jalalain says, So they set off after leaving the ship, making their way on foot until when they met a boy who had not yet reached puberty, playing with other boys, among whom his face was the fairest, and he, Al-Khudr, slew him by slitting his throat with a knife while he lay down, or by tearing his head off with his hand, or by smashing his head against the wall, all of which are different opinions. But these contradictions in how this boy was killed were resolved by the exegesis of Qurtubi on these verses. He says, There is no contradiction between these three stories. Maybe he smashed his head first with a rock, then he slaughtered him with a knife before plucking his head off his body. 
I have to keep reminding you that we're talking about a good man, a true follower of God, killing a young child in the most vicious ways imaginable. What do you expect from ISIS today when these stories are found in the Quran and the victims can be young children with their heads smashed and decapitated? So, in conclusion to this point, brutality certainly has its precedence and appears justified on many levels within Islam. I think the point of burning people alive is something that is mildly contentious. Those who argue that it's Islamic can count on the occasion that Muhammad was set to burn people for not praying, as well as his senior companions actually burning people. While those who argue it isn't have a narration telling them that it shouldn't be done. To say this has nothing to do with Islam is again misleading. And to be fair, what Muhammad himself did to the people in the desert by chopping off their hands and legs before inserting large iron nails into their eyes and leaving them to bleed to death is at least equally, if not much more brutal than the burning of the Jordanian pilot or the other brutal executions done by ISIS so far. That's all for this episode. The next one will be looking at the killing of homosexuals. Share these videos where you can with Muslims or apologists for Islam who tell you constantly that ISIS has nothing to do with Islam. Until next time, Arrivederci.